of Christ we stand. Amen. Father, we stand in the power of your holy name and the promise and the redemption of your son. We thank you for that. And God, I pray that now you would speak to us through your holy word. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Nathan and guys. We appreciate your leading us into the presence of God and reminded us of who he is. I'm glad that you're here today. I am uh, excited to be here as well. I am always excited about the opportunity to be able to preach and consider it a real honor to be able to stand before you. And my goal as we're meeting here today is simply to share with you what God has laid on my heart. I think it's important when we come together, especially in seminary chapel, for us to be honest with each other and to set aside the opportunities to try and impress one another, but instead just to speak from our heart about things that God has been teaching us and in turn then to be challenging to one another so that as we live, leave this place today, we are truly working and striving and placing ourselves before God with the desire that he could use us and that we would be more like him. You are all uh, honored guests to be here, and I appreciate you being here today. My wife, Jana, is here, and she's always a uh, special person, and I'm thankful that she's here. And we've been married 28 years, and all 28 years that we've been married, we have been attached uh, here at the seminary either as a student or on faculty, and we love this place, but as much as I love this place, I love my wife much more. And I am so thankful for her and thankful for her continued support, friendship. It is wonderful to be married to your best friend, and it is great to be on the journey together. I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and look in Isaiah chapter 66. We'll be reading the first two verses in just a moment. I want us to talk these few moments that we have together about what it means to live a life that God takes note of. In the world in which we live, there are a lot of people who are seeking many different ways to try to get God's attention. And I believe that many of those are simply erring ways. And today I want us to look into the Word of God and see what God says about living a life that He takes note of. Jared had finally come to a point in his life where an event was getting ready to happen that he had longed for for many years. He had just gotten his driver's license and finally had gotten permission to go out on his first date and to take the girl that he had dreamed of dating on a date to the movies and then they were going to go out to eat. Everything went according to schedule. He drove, he picked her up, there were no accidents. He did as his parents had been telling him to text him, to text them all along the way to let them know exactly where he was. They went to the movie, they went out to eat, and everything was fine. And then came that awkward moment. Guys, you know what we're talking about. It's that final walk back up to the door after you leave the car and you're trying to run into your mind or run through your mind exactly how are we going to end this time together. He was contemplating whether he should kiss or not, and he had talked with some of his friends who had given him varied advice. And so he decided he was just going to go with the flow of things, and we all know how dangerous that can be. He got to the door. He decided to express to this young lady he had spent time with how much he had enjoyed the evening and decided he was getting ready to walk away. And when he did, he had that impulse that he wanted to kiss her before he left. So he turned and closed his eyes and leaned forward and kissed her right on the chin. After that is over comes that awkward moment where you really don't know what to do at this point. And in a moment of complete nerves, he looks at her and said, well, what do you think about it? <laughs> to which she responded, it's pretty good, but perhaps next time you should aim a little higher. I wonder how many times in our life that God looks at us and says, you know what, you're living pretty good, but perhaps you should try and aim a little higher. I'm afraid that too often in life we get very comfortable just dwelling where we are, going through the routines, doing things that we think are important, and all along we may actually be settling for less than what God desires for us to be and to do in this world. 
As a matter of fact, I'm afraid that one of the things that happens is that we get so caught up in the doing of things that we forget that perhaps the highest life that God is calling us to live is not found in the doing of things, but instead in the being the person that God wants us to be. And perhaps if we're not careful, we find ourselves always living a little less than what God desires. Perhaps not living far enough below God's desire that we find ourselves in tremendous trouble. But all along, knowing in our heart, we're not the people God wants us to be. And so today, I want to talk to you, even as you have started the first few weeks of seminary, but many of you have been on a journey with Christ for years. Some of you, perhaps even a year or less, but God wants to encourage us to strive to be the people He wants us to be, to be the individuals that He takes notice of. I'll go ahead and tell you to begin with, I'm convinced that we are tempted oftentimes to do things in order to get God's attention. We think that the size of our congregation, the number of our books sold, the number of people who follow us on Twitter, perhaps our salaries and our positions are things that impress God. But I want to remind you today that according to the Word of God, those are not the things that God notices in our lives. Read with me in Isaiah chapter 66. I'll be reading the first two verses. I'm reading from the New American Standard. In Isaiah chapter 66, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah's writing and he says, Thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me and where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things and thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word. The children of Israel had come to a point in their life where they were preparing to build the temple. And one of the things that God was trying to help them understand is that building the temple was a good thing, but God wanted to do something within their lives individually as opposed to just a building. And he speaks to them and reminds them in the very opening words. And I love this passage. Well, here's what God says very clearly. God says, I made the earth, I made the heavens, I made everything that's out there to the point that heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool. And then he asks a rhetorical question. So if I made all these things... What do you think you can make for me that I don't already have or that I need? You have met people who have had many things. Perhaps you had a friend when you were growing up and they were gifted many times by their parents. Perhaps we could refer to them as spoiled cautiously. And you remember those challenging times of going to the store to pick out a gift for them at birthday or Christmas and you wound up getting them something totally bizarre because they had everything they could possibly want. But when it comes to God, God says, you know what? I don't need anything. As a matter of fact, there's nothing you can give me that I need or that I want. It is important, again, from the very opening that we recognize that the reality is we serve a great God. He is sovereign. He is Lord. He is creator. He is transcendent, high and lifted up. He's the creator of all the earth, and there is nothing that we can do with our hands that will impress Him. There is nothing that we can do by building larger buildings or by drawing greater numbers, by writing better books, by going to conferences, or any of those things. So they're all important What really catches the eye of God? I was reminded even this morning when I was coming over to chapel, uh, I knew Jana was coming, and I was thinking of the first time that I can really remember 
Jana being on my radar, and I have to be careful about this story because I don't want to get in trouble when I go home, but I can remember we were in BSU in those days in breakfast. We were in leadership positions, and every Tuesday morning we would come together, and I can remember that I had seen her come into that room for breakfast often, but there was one time when I can remember her walking in and she caught my eye. And things were different from that moment forward. In the life that we live, what does it take for us to catch the eye of God? What does it take to be noticed by God? Did you hear what he said? He spells it out clearly in the passage that we lit, that we've just read that the way we are noticed by God, the way we catch his eye is by being the people he desires for us to be and to have the characteristics that are found within us that are pleasing to him. He shows us three characteristics in this passage that we've looked at. Out of all the creation, out of all the world, this is the person God zeroes in and notices. First of all, he says this, the person that God notices is a person who is humble. Humble. We like Humility, especially when it's found in someone else's life. We like for other people to be humble around us because it gives us the opportunity to exalt ourselves and to make us feel good. But God tells us in the passage that we've just read that humility is one of those characteristics that should be found within our lives. Humility is where we come to a point in our lives where we simply realize that without question, we are in need of God. We cannot make it in this life on our own. We need his power. We need his help. We need his strength. We need his wisdom. And when all is said and done, you and I come to a point where we cry out and we say, we need God. You've heard oftentimes many stories, especially about guys who refuse to admit that they need Well, all of us have to come to a point in our lives where we come and we say, God, I come before you today recognizing without question that I am in need of you. Isn't this where our salvation begins? Isn't this that moment when we start following after Christ where we, as Paul describes in the book of Galatians, we've come to a moment where we've recognized we cannot save ourselves. We cannot be good enough. We cannot do enough good things to bring about our own salvation. And we have to lay ourselves before God and say, God, I need you in my life. I need you to do a work in my life that only you can do. And then the challenge is, and Paul makes this clear again in the book of Galatians, is that once we have come to that point in our lives, we spend the rest of our lives consistently and constantly going before God and saying, God, I not only needed you to bring me into your kingdom, to bring me to a point of where I can follow after you and become your child, but I need you every day to give me strength and power to continue to live the life that you have called me to live. Culture tells us that the problem with man today is oftentimes low self-esteem. I believe that the Bible tells us that perhaps the problem with culture and with man today is that we have too much self-esteem. We think too highly of ourselves. We think that we can do it on our own. We think that we can create sermons and that we can make churches grow and that we can have an impact upon the kingdom and that we can make ourselves live a life that would catch the attention of God. And instead, what he tells us is that the person that God notices in the scripture, it says, this is the one that I look at. This is the person that I esteem, that I consider to be of value as a person who is humble. It's easy, by the way, to say, God, we need you, and then go about our lives and do our own things. But humility takes place in our lives where we walk and there is not just a desire for God, there is a craving for God. As the psalmist says, we get to the point where we say, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek seek you. My soul longs for you. My heart hungers for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. When that becomes our prayer, we find ourselves in a point where we are longing for God and we are humbled because we recognize we need him in order to 
exist upon this earth. Self-sufficiency will rob us of our relationship with God as we become proud instead of humble. Do you crave God? Do you recognize your need for God more than just at exam time? Or perhaps on Saturday night when you're looking for a sermon? Or perhaps when you're standing before a board of deacons and you don't know what to say and suddenly you start uttering words, God, I need you. And what God has been saying to you all along is that you have actually needed God long before you stood before the board of deacons. Humility. Humble. He also tells us in this passage, he says, to this one will I look, to one who is humble and to one who is contrite of spirit. It's kind of a King James-ish type word. The word literally means broken. It comes from the idea of being lamed and stricken. It comes when we recognize not only do we need God, but that we stand before God as one who is a sinner and that we have been saved by God's grace and that we are continually being saved by His grace, not because of who we are. Being contrite is that idea of, as Nancy DeMoss has said, living with the roof off and seeing ourselves as God looks down upon us and sees us as sinners who have been saved. Sinners who have been rescued, but sinners nonetheless. Again, without being contrite, we become self-righteous. A lack of humility, by the way, leads to self-sufficiency. A lack of brokenness leads to self-righteousness. It's where we forget that we have been saved by God's grace and we begin to look down upon others and we even make statements like, well, I remember when I was like that. God forgive us for taking his grace for granted and for thinking that somehow once we have been redeemed and claimed to be his, that we become something that we're not. Some of you are thinking by this point, if I wanted this much encouragement, I didn't have to come to chapel today to get it. But the reality is, wouldn't you desire more so to see yourself as God sees you with the reality that God is going to take notice of your life than to live a life of self-sufficiency and self-righteousness and miss out on the favor and the blessings of God in your life? And so what he says to us is that we must be individuals who are contrite. One of my favorite parables, Dr. Jerry Brazil, my mentor uh, here when I was at seminary, Dr. Brazil used to say that a parable is a theological bombshell dropped in the midst of ignorance and unbelief. It's one of those definitions that I've hung on to. But the, one time Jesus told this parable to people who considered themselves righteous on their own. And he told the parable of how two men went to the temple to pray one day. There was a tax collector and a Pharisee. I've preached on that in this very uh, pulpit before. A tax collector was one that every mother looked at and said to her son, if you don't behave, that's what you're going to be like when you grow up. The Pharisee, on the other hand, was outwardly religious. And every mother pointed at that Pharisee and said, when you grow up, I hope you become just like him. And the reason why is they were called on the outside. They both went to the temple and prayed. And when they got to the temple, it says real clearly that the Pharisee made his way to the front of the temple. And in the process of praying, it says he stood and he began to lift his voice. And Jesus says, almost in a very sly way, and he prayed to himself. By the way, I don't think that means that he was praying quietly. I think he was praying rather aloud so that everybody could hear his prayer. But the reality is the only person that was listening to him was himself, not God. And so that day he prayed, and here's what he prayed. God, I thank you I'm not like all those people, adulterers and swindlers and murderers. By the way, isn't it interesting? He picked the worst to compare himself to to make him feel the best. That tells you a lot right there. And then he starts looking around and he sees way in the back there's a man who happens to be a tax collector and he points his finger and he says, God, 
And I thank you I'm not like that man. And the irony of the story is found in the truth that if the Pharisee had been more like that man, he actually would have been more like God than he was. Because in the back of the temple courts, there was a man who was a tax collector, and the Scripture says that he wouldn't even look up, but instead he kept beating his chest, and he kept looking down, and he kept saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Not a sinner, not kind of a sinner. I am the sinner, the sinner. And Jesus said, one went away righteous. Contrite. Aware of who we are, aware of what God has done in our lives, and aware that it is because of God's grace that we have been able to be in a relationship with Him. And by the way, it is because of God's grace that we are even here today. You've been called to ministry. You've been called on this journey with Him. Not because He looked down and said, hey, I can't do without that person. I would remind you, Heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. What can you do to impress him? But because of his grace, despite our sinfulness, he has reached out. And so we spend the rest of our lives reminded of who we are. I find it interesting that as Paul got ready to write the first letter to the Corinthians that we have, he says this, I am the least of the apostles. I am the least of the apostles, and I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. And then a few years later, about seven years later, he sits down and he writes the letter to the church of Ephesus, and he says this, I am less than least of all God's people. You hear what's happening? And then as he, about five years after that, he sits down, he writes to this young man named Timothy, and you know what he says? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. When you follow that through in Paul's life, here's what you discover. You discover that Paul had this continual sense and an awareness of the simple fact that it was God's grace that saved him because he was just a sinner saved by God's grace. And the more aware he became of God's grace and the longer he walked with God on a daily basis, the more aware he became of his own sin. The temptation in ministry, again, is that if we're not careful, the longer we walk with Christ and the longer we serve him, the colder our hearts grow to who we used to be or who we think we used to be, but in reality who we still are. Sinners saved by God's grace. When I was a student, Jan and I went to First Baptist Church, and Roger Freeman was the pastor at that time. And Roger Freeman and I actually shared something in common that I share with some of you guys here. The first semester that I was here, uh, Jan and I were engaged but not married, and I lived on the second floor of Litzy. From what I've heard, it really hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, but uh, Roger Freeman said this. He says, you know, so, so many times we come to a point where we think we live above sin. And Roger Freeman said... The only time I ever lived above sin is when I lived on the second floor of Litzy. <laughs> Contrite, broken, lamed, sinner saved by God's grace. Let me simply tell you before we move on to the final point. When we grasp that, when we grasp that we are Sinners saved by God's grace. And we get lost in the wonder of it on a daily basis, on a constant basis, that we are sinners saved by His grace. I promise you our ministries will change. And our walk with Christ will change because no longer do we look down at the people that we minister to or shake our head in frustration at people who stumble, but we understand because their story is our story as well. Sinners saved by God's grace. Humble, contrite. And then he describes it in the end of verse 2. He says this, And one who trembles at my word. Trembles at my word. So what he says is this, Out of all the people that are here, all the people that have been created, 
The person who's humble gets my notice. The person who is contrite, and by the way, I don't think that we choose which of these we're supposed to be. These are supposed to be collective descriptions. Humble and contrite and reverent. Tremble at the Word of God. That we come to a point, we look into the Word of God, and we hear Him speaking, and as He speaks, we understand that this is God who speaks to us. And we don't take it lightly, but we take it seriously. In moments like this, as we stand and we speak for God, in our quiet times as we hear God speak, and when we do our ministries, that we stand before Him in fear because the Holy God has spoken to us and we don't want to miss a word that He's saying and we don't want to misunderstand what He's saying, but we want to respond obediently to every word that God speaks. God forgive us if preaching and speaking and teaching ever becomes a vocation for us. Because instead, you and I, and I tell people this all the time, I feel, the, I feel to be one of the most blessed people around. I get to teach for 20 years. I've had the opportunity to teach the Word of God regularly here at seminary. I get to pastor and preach. And on top of that, I get to read the Word and let it speak to me on a regular basis as God speaks to me. But if we're not careful, we take all those things for granted and it becomes something we do. And we open up the Word. And by the way, the danger we face is we open up the Word because we've got to have a sermon. We've got to do something on Sunday. God, show me what we need to do on Sunday. When in reality, you know what He wants us to do? He wants us to open his word and hear him speak to us first. And when he hear, we hear him speak to us first, he wants us to tremble because the holy God has spoken to us. It's not a good textbook. It's not a sermon source. It's the word of God. And by the way, the word of God is not just found in Scripture. It's found as he speaks to us and he begins to, to move us so that in turn when we hear the word of God, we do what he calls us to do. My friends, we spend so much time talking for God that if we're not careful, we miss it when God speaks to us. I talked about it in class this morning. The great danger of, of, of being the, the voice of God and forgetting that if God, we're not listening to God speak to us, we don't have a right to be the voice of God anywhere. So he says we have to be ones who are reverent, who are listening, who are anxious to hear the word of God. And when he speaks, we tremble in it. You've had the same experiences I've had before. Um, I've, I've had those moments where you preach your heart out and somebody walks out the back door and they shake your hand and they say this good speech. Uh, and, and I know their heart. I do know their heart. Many times people don't know what's saying. They're trying to encourage you, and I appreciate that. But God forbid that we should ever take the Word of God and make it into a good speech. It's the Word of God. And by the way, the people that we minister to will struggle to tremble at the and, and to have the fear of God when they hear Him speak unless they see it in those of us who are saying, Thus saith the Lord. Humble, contrite, reverent, trembling at the very word of God, obedient to God, doing what he's asked us to do. So in closing, I simply ask you this. Are you the person that God takes notice of? Now, here's the really hard part. I believe that every time we open the word of God, it challenges us to make a decision. And, and right now... There's all kinds of things running through our mind. Uh, maybe God's speaking to you and you're saying something like this. Don't let what God's doing in the depth of my heart be seen on my face because I don't want my friend sitting next to me to think that I'm under conviction at this moment. And what I would just tell you is simply this. Fail. You just failed. Or perhaps you're... you're running through your mind, 10 people who need to experience contriteness in their life. And I just remind you, when you do that, the Pharisee that you despise is the Pharisee you've just become. Because what God tells us to do is this, look in 
your life in your heart and ask yourself, are you the person God wants you to be? And so in closing, just think about this. If we say that we're so close to God, because after all, that's who we are. We're seminary people. We're the future of the church. By the way, we're the present of the church as well. As in present time, not always as in a gift. But uh, we're, we're the present part of the church. But if we're so close to God, where's our passion for God and for His Word? They used to refer to it as the unction. Where's the unction? That fire that burns down deep inside. Where are tears? Where, where's the mourning in our own lives and the grieving over who we are and who we have been and what it has cost God? When's the last time you've honestly cried out to God, God, be merciful to me, the sinner? And is that your daily cry? Where are those people who abhor sin? Where are the Jeremiah's whose eyes are filled with tears over the condition of people who are also caught in sin? Where are men and women who are willing to risk their reputations and retirement funds and, and acceptance in the Christian community and live a different life that Christ has called us to live, a life, a life of being humble and contrite and reverent and trembling before His words and being more concerned about what God thinks about us than we are about what other people think about us. There's an old song that says, It's not my brother, it's not my sister, it's not my mother, it's not my father, but it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, who's standing in the need of prayer. And so my prayer for you today is simply this. Would you go to God and ask Him to look carefully at your life? And then would you be willing to come to God and do what He's asking you to do? To be humble. To be contrite. And to be reverent. And would you be willing to say, God... That's the person I want to be this minute. Would you join me as we close? Father, thank you for your word. And we do, God, as we stand before your word, we, we tremble at your word. It reveals much about who we are. And it reveals who you want us to be. So, Father, I pray that as we look into your word, as we hear you speak, that today you would speak to each one of us, God. We want your, your blessings in our lives. We want you to take notice of us, not so that we can, not so that with pride we can say that you notice us, but God, we just want to bring you pleasure and glory and honor with the life that we live. And so I pray today you'd speak to us. Encourage us even as we prepare for lunch and the rest of this day to make the decisions, to make the life adjustments that you'd have us to make. We thank you for the grace that you've given us and the salvation that is ours because of you. And pray you continue to walk with us this day. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here.